Hey everyone, ready for another deep dive. Today, we're strapping in for a wild ride where quantum computing meets the world of mechanics. Get this, we're talking about simulations so intense, they could make even the most powerful computers sweat. Yeah, and what's really exciting is that this paper we're looking at dives into how this quantum power could completely change how we design and understand materials. Okay, color me intrigued. We're talking about the kind of tech that could make today's supercomputers look like, well, maybe not toys, but definitely a blast from the past. Exactly. And this paper specifically tackles something called computational homogenization, basically. How the microscopic world influences the big picture. Okay, I'm all yours. How do we even wrap our heads around that? Imagine you're building a skyscraper, right? You need to know those steel beams can handle everything. But to simulate those materials down to the atom, that's a computational nightmare, even for the beefiest computers we have now. So cue the dramatic music. This is where Quantum swoops in to save the day. You got it. That's exactly where this paper comes in. They're exploring how quantum computers could make those crazy complex simulations not just possible, but almost easy. Easy. Okay, maybe not snapping my fingers easy, but I like where you're going with this. So riddle me this. How do quantum computers even work? I mean, they're not just faster, right? It's a whole different ballgame. A whole new ballgame. Traditional computers think bits, like tiny switches, on or off, zero or one. What? But quantum computers, they use qubits. It's like a switch that could be on, off, or get this, both at the same time. Whoa, okay, my brain just did a loop-de-loop. -loop. That's insane. Right. That's something called superposition, and it lets these quantum computers explore tons of possibilities all at once. Imagine running a million simulations in the time it takes to snap your fingers, instead of just one at a time. All right, now that's the kind of speed we're talking about. But hold up, let's get down to brass tacks. We're diving into computational homogenization, right? What exactly are we talking about here? Okay, so picture this. You're trying to bake the most amazing cake ever. But instead of using a recipe, you're analyzing every single grain of flour, each tiny molecule of sugar. Talk about tedious. Right. That's kind of what we're doing with materials. We're trying to understand how a material behaves by zooming in on how its absolute tiniest components interact. All right, so we're talking nanoscale baking here. But what you're saying is, with this quantum approach, we can skip the analyzing every grain of flour step. That's the gist of it. Homogenization is all about finding those shortcuts. We're developing some pretty clever math and computational techniques to predict how a material will behave overall without getting lost in the weeds of each individual atom or molecule. It's like figuring out if that cake will be dense and fudgy or light and airy just by knowing the general properties of the ingredients. So we're baking with quantum power, huh? I like the analogy. But where does this quantum computing magic actually come in? How do we go from nanoscale to, wow, that's fast? Well, that's where things get really interesting. This paper uses a quantum version of something called the Fast Fourier Transform, or FFT. And don't worry, I promise it's not as scary as it sounds. Oh, Fourier Transform. You know, those words always make me think I should be wearing a lab coat and safety goggles. But I'm with you. Break it down for me. Think of it this way. Imagine you're listening to a whole orchestra, right? But you want to isolate the sound of, say, just the violins. The FFT is like this amazing filter that can pull that single sound out from the rest of the music. Okay, that actually makes sense. So it's like breaking down complex patterns? Exactly. And it's super useful in simulations because it helps us analyze things like vibrations and forces all kinds of patterns we see in mechanics. Now, the quantum Fourier transform, or QFT, does the same thing, but exponentially faster. Hold on, did you just say exponentially? We're talking about a serious speed boost here, right? Imagine analyzing that entire orchestra's performance in the blink of an eye. That's the kind of speed we're talking about. Okay, you've officially blown my mind. But I have to ask, how do we actually get this quantum magic to work? I mean, do we just feed the problem into a quantum computer and it spits out the answer? It would be amazing if it were that simple. But there's a crucial step before that we need to teach the quantum computer how to understand the problem. It's like we need to speak its language, and that's where quantum encoding comes in. Quantum encoding? It's like we're sending the computer a secret message. You got it. <laughs> we use these things called quibits, and we can use them to represent different parts of our mechanics problem. So things like the stiffness of a material or the forces acting on it, we can translate all of that into the language of quibits. So it's like creating a quantum dictionary for a simulation. Exactly. And this whole translation process, this quantum encoding, is what allows the QFT to really work its magic and speed up those calculations. Fascinating stuff. 
But how do we actually know this whole quantum approach actually works in practice? Did the researchers actually put this to the test? Oh, they absolutely did. Yeah. They didn't just theorize about it. They actually built and tested their quantum algorithm. They used this platform called Quiskit, which is kind of like a programming language for quantum computers. All right, so they built their quantum program, but what were they actually simulating? Was it a whole skyscraper? Well, they started with something called Poisson problems, which, believe it or not, are actually super common in physics and engineering. Poisson problems sounds a little intimidating. Give me an example. Okay, say you're designing a new kind of heat sink for a computer chip, right? You need to figure out how the heat's going to flow through all those different materials. That's a Poisson problem. Okay, so... Pretty essential stuff. And they use these Poisson problems to figure out if their quantum homogenization algorithm could actually deliver. Exactly. They ran simulations in one dimension and two dimensions, kind of like starting with a simple line and then leveling up to a flat surface. And get this, the results were really impressive. Don't leave me hanging. What kind of impressive are we talking? So, first of all, yeah, the quantum algorithm actually produced accurate results, which is always a good sign. Yeah. But what really blew me away was how much more efficient it was compared to our traditional methods. It used way fewer computational resources. So not just right answers, but right answers faster. Sounds like a win-win to me. A huge win. Yeah. But hold on, there's more. They didn't stop there. They took it a step further and actually applied their algorithm to a real homogenization problem. Okay, things just got real. So they leveled up from Poisson problems to a full-blown simulation. What was the challenge this time? This time, they simulated a composite rod. Imagine a rod made up of different segments, and each segment has a different stiffness, like a chain where some links are stronger than others. Got it. They basically built a simplified version of a real material with all those varying properties. Getting ready for the grand finale? Hit me with it. Did it work? It did. The algorithm nailed it. It accurately predicted the overall stiffness of the entire rod, even with all those different segments. So they proved that this quantum approach could handle the complexity of a real-world material. That's exactly it. And even though it was a simplified simulation, it's still a huge deal. It shows us that this approach has the potential to handle way more complex simulations in the future. It's like they built the engine for a quantum spaceship, and now it's just a question of fueling it up and aiming for the stars. That's a great way to put it. And this research gives us a glimpse into the incredible potential of quantum computing to completely revolutionize fields like material science and engineering. So we've gone from quantum cake to quantum spaceships today. I'm definitely feeling the power of this tech. But really, this feels like we're on the edge of something huge. What could this mean for the future of, say, material science? Well, imagine designing a material, atom by atom tweaking its properties, just like you adjust the settings on, I don't know, a piece of software. That kind of control is what we're talking about. So no more crossing our fingers in the lab and hoping for the best. No more happy accidents. It's about really understanding and manipulating the core of what makes a material tick. We can create materials lighter and stronger than anything we've ever seen. Imagine materials that can heal themselves or even change depending on the environment. Okay, now you're just making me want to jump into the future. Self-healing bridges, buildings that adapt to earthquakes. It sounds like something out of a movie. And it goes even further than just materials. Imagine simulating incredibly complex systems, like the airflow over an airplane wing, or, heck, even predicting earthquakes with unbelievable accuracy. We're talking about a total game changer in how we understand the world around us, but... All right, let's bring it back down to Earth for a second. Be honest, how long until I can actually get my hands on one of these quantum computers? We'd all love to have a quantum computer on our desks. And while we're making incredible progress, there are still some hurdles to overcome. It's kind of like the early days of computers, you know? Those massive machines that took up entire rooms. Oh yeah, definitely not as sleek as our laptops today. Exactly. Right now, quantum computers, they're still really sensitive to their environment, and we're still learning the best ways to program them. It's a learning process. Steep learning curve, but the payoff could be enormous. This has been an amazing look into the world of quantum computing and mechanics. It's clear that we're just scratching the surface of what's possible. So listener, until next time, keep those minds curious, and we'll catch you on our next deep dive.